Welcome, everybody. So I think we can get started. We have about 37 people connected so far, and we are right on time. So very pleased to be here. I'm going to give a quick uh, introduction of the agenda to remind us all of what is planned for today. And then let's go, let's dive right in. So uh, my name is Alistair Schneider. I'm the CEO of Innovo. Uh, we are in Boston, located in Boston. We are also helping with the Strasbourg-Boston Bridge, and uh, I believe the city of Boston is on the call today with us as well. We help create new businesses. We create, we help also with U.S. venture capital, and we're a venture studio based in uh, Boston and Strasbourg, and it's really uh, fantastic to be here today. Special thanks to Michel Lucer, who's a local business angel in Strasbourg, without uh, whom uh, this event, you know, and this adventure that we're living, you know, wouldn't be happening. Thanks also to Delphine Krieger, the Economic Development of Strasbourg, Sarah Delude, also from the Economic Development of um, uh, Boston this time, as well as the entire list of partners of each ecosystem. I'm not going to name them all, Semia, BioValley, Sactonectus, Mihai, Mass General Hospital, a lot of different partners, and today uh, with us as well, Irka and NextMed. Why are we here today? So the idea is about innovation that solves problems, right? So we've identified major issues. So things like what you know, some have coined the age quake. So aging demographics causing many more new pressing needs, unmet needs in healthcare. So chronic diseases, cancer, and so on. Also the revolution 4.0, which you know, brings opportunities and challenges at the same time. So creating the most importantly through the merge of technology, digital, and biology. Also one recommended conference post this event for everybody, a great uh, conference on the cancer uh, and evolution, cancer revolution. Uh, where basically Azra Raza shared that you know cancer, uh, the, the name of the game is in cancer is really early detection, right? So despite having spent 215 billion on cures, biotech and so on, still we don't have better outcome you know, than in 1930. So what I found very interesting about this sort of statement is today we have amazing people who are in Strasbourg working mostly in the early detection part. So surgery, but also CT scanning, you know, you'll, see, you'll hear about visible patient a little bit later on. So I think, you know, Strasbourg can play a huge role in really in that, that area, working with Boston, the biotech hub, working also with Switzerland, the biotech hub. So I wanted to set a little bit, a few questions before we start, you know, on what are the next big things, right? In oncology, is it early detection, prevention, telehealth, access to healthcare? There's a lot of innovation that needs to happen, especially because we have this age quake in front of us, a booming demography, uh, a lot of older people which will uh, be in, which are in front of us, which means we need new innovation, streamline the healthcare systems, help the government fund these also, you know, uh, healthcare um, basically treatments, and really find new solutions. So it's quite exciting to be here today. And the future is in our hands. And that's why we're here today to talk about the future a little bit. How can we collaborate more? How can we you know, make sense of everything that is going on and narrow our focus and basically innovate, solve these problems and really create strong economies for tomorrow. Today, you're gonna hear about our US Consul General in Strasbourg, Dara Paradiso, a keynote for 10 minutes. Then you will hear about from Ander Elustando, policy officer at the European Commission with Janos Tolias, also expert in new technologies and AI. Then NextMed with Nicolas Pellerin, our director at NextMed. Professor Maresco, founder of IRCAD uh, and his amazing story. Um, we're really thrilled to have you, Professor Jacques Maresco, and looking forward to hear this today. And finally, Luc Soler, President, Visible Patient for 20 minutes. And then we'll go into questions. So this is meant to be a forum. So please do ask questions in the chat. I will moderate, make sure we have questions for every speaker. So with no further ado, our US Consul General Dara Paradiso. Welcome, Dara. We're looking forward to hearing from you. 
Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, and good morning in Boston. My name is Dara Paradiso. I am the Consul General of the United States of America in Strasbourg. Uh, I've been here since August, so relatively new, and this is an amazing city so far. And I have to say it's great to see some friends uh, on the screen already, and I am glad to be in your hands for the future because this is quite an amazing grouping of folks. Uh, it's an honor to talk to you today and to be able to support this initiative. And I know that this has been in the works for months. Um, the collaboration and the partnership has been ongoing for quite a while. And this is part of the bigger anniversary celebration of Strasbourg and Boston, which I've traveled all over the world in 21 years of diplomacy. And I have to say, this is probably the strongest sister city a relationship that I've ever seen. It is really amazing to see. And I love that people are so invested in it. Um, it's been great on this project to see how a whole ecosystem has come together and mobilized to ensure that we have a good welcome on both sides for businesses. And uh, it's wonderful to see American businesses wanting to do business in France and in Europe. And of course, the other way around as well. Originally, we were hoping to be able to do this talk and more at my residence. Uh, over a nice reception. So I regret that that has not been possible because of COVID, but I hope that we will have a chance to celebrate together in the future. My doors are always open for any of you. Uh, I'd love to host any of the American companies here, our friends in Boston. If you make it over, please let us know at the consulate that you're coming. We would love to get you together and, and introduce you to um, the folks here and hear more about what you're working on. So in general, the US Consulate General, I just wanna say a few things about how we support um, this operation and business exchange in general. Um, in general, there's already a lot of exchange between Boston and Strasbourg uh, on an individual level and a company level. But this year with the Sister City Partnership, it was a chance to make it more systematic and look at the strengths that the two cities have in common with tech partnerships and excellence in medical technology, and also um, two city governments that are really interested in making a good environment for business to enter in. So this is a chance to make it a little bit more systematic and formalized. Um, and I understand that you've already had a number of virtual events. I'm sorry that I missed out on some of those, but I'm glad to be able to join you for this one. I think the one we're doing tonight is really important because when Americans come to France and more globally to Europe, they feel that they've, they're on familiar ground. We have so much in common and American businesses know that when they come to Europe, they are secure in their property, they're protected by rule of law. Innovation is encouraged, it's also the IPR is protected, but despite these similarities, there are certain divergences on important issues that we have to take into account when we're doing business. And there are some cultural differences as well. So of course, um, data management, data protection is one of these issues where we have a total, the concept, we share the values, we recognize it on both sides of the Atlantic, but our approach to how to regulate it is actually quite different. So it's important to be able to talk to each other in advance and have some expertise shared about these regulations and how to navigate the differences. Um, a, the regulation at the European level on data privacy and artificial intelligence are particularly important elements to consider for startups, especially when you're talking about medical technology. So I am very, very grateful that we have two excellent speakers from the European Commission today. Uh, Mr. Andre Alistando and Mr. Janos Polias. We appreciate you being here and it is crucial for US businesses to be able to understand the issues that you work on in order to be successful when they come to Europe to do business. And it is also great to have so many other wonderful speakers today, including Professor uh, Marasco, who I have not had a chance to meet in person, but I'm looking very much forward to coming to the studio. Um, you have the coolest backdrop of all of us today, and I can't wait to learn more about your cat in person. Uh, and of course, uh, Nicolas Pellerin from NextMed and Luc Soler. And I look forward to meeting with all of you in person. And it's great to bring us all together. I'm sorry it's by Zoom and not over drinks, but we'll do it another time. Uh, and just quickly, I want to conclude by explaining what some of our resources at the U.S. Embassy in Paris and the U.S. Consulate General 
in Strasbourg are for American businesses. Um, there is a Boston Export Assistance Center based in Boston, which is linked with the Foreign Commercial Service from the US Department of Commerce. And they can also assist with finding business partners in Europe. But here on the ground, we also can provide some basic support. If you're looking at coming into this market, we can help you navigate the local scene. We can help, um, we can help introduce you to people to talk about the kind of expertise we're doing today about regulations. And uh, we are constantly looking at the different business issues here and paying attention to a level playing field for American businesses. And for French companies who are looking to go to the US, we can do the same things in reverse and talk about some partnerships there, what you need to know about starting in the US. And we have some great programs like Select USA, where we can help introduce you to good partners on the other side of the Atlantic. So with that, I just wanna say, enjoy today's opportunity to share information. I hope you have a very good conference. And thank you all again for your participation and your hard work. This is an extremely important part of the exchange year. Uh, and it really helps build the relationship between Strasbourg and Boston. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this. Um, this kicks, kicks off basically the conference for today. So thank you, Dara Paradiso, for being with us. Uh, so next, we have Nicolas Pellerin, our director from NextMed. And he's going to share with you the vision uh, that he has for NextMed and for us innovators, entrepreneurs uh, in the healthcare space. So Nicola, are you with us? Perfect. Excellent. Thank you, everybody, yeah, for being yeah. here. Just taking the quick uh, second to thank all the participants. I see we have a, a few people from the Children's Hospital of Boston, uh, from the city of Boston uh, also joined us. So really great to have you all and everyone from Strasbourg as well. I'm extremely pleased to have you. Okay. Can I go, Alisa? Absolutely, Nick. Well, let's go. Okay. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, Thank you, Alistair, for having uh, organized this event. I want so, uh, I also want to um, uh, to say a warm welcome to uh, to the panelists and the uh, the audience. Uh, and today, so I'm going to present to NextMed the uh, the future of healthcare driven by vertical precision ecosystem, uh, and the future of healthcare is is now. Uh, let me welcome you, welcome you to Europe, uh, even if it's only digital. Welcome, uh, welcome to Swazburg, uh, Swazburg that have been uh, ranked first among French cities for its quality of life. And welcome to NextMed, the open hub dedicated to uh, improving care. Uh, as you all know, uh, nowadays we have to face uh, some pressing challenges such as the uh, global growing aging population, uh, but also major healthcare unmet needs as chronic diseases or new diagnose, diagnosis tools for cancer early detection. Uh, in fact, uh, forecasts for 2030 indicate that 70% of deaths worldwide will be due to chronic diseases. So this is a very, very tricky point. Uh, and recently, also, as you already said, uh, Alistair, in an inspiring conference by Professor Azra Raza, she focused on counselor early detection as a key issue to avoid spending billions in new drug discovery. Uh, and we we also have to uh, we, we also have to uh, to face an evolution of our health models with the need to consider combination uh, between EI, EL, and biology, where biotech previously sought to solve many many problems. And if we take the example of EL, the global market will increase by 160 percent in uh, 2023. So it's a uh, it's a big big market to uh, to tackle. So I just will went wait two or three seconds just to be sure that you can see the uh, the, the slide on your uh, on your screen. And what is next med? So part of very a very specific cross border environment, including France, Germany, and Switzerland. Next med is an healthcare district that aims at being the headquarters for healthcare companies who want to enter the European market. Uh, next Next ambitions is to bring together on the single site in the earth of Strasbourg, 
patients, doctors, researchers, and companies in the health sector. The, the aim is to promote the creation of development and new businesses through scientific and medical research partnership in order to design the 21st century health technology. And as you can see on the, uh, on the slide, uh, the next next district is, is very close to the cathedrals. So it's uh, um, located at the, uh, the center of the city. It's just 300 meters away from the, uh, from the cathedral. As you can see, uh, our transnational environment allows outstanding cooperation to reduce time to market. Uh, and also, as you can see, a number of large companies have some uh, R&D capability within this uh, synergistic ecosystem. Uh, and I would like to mention that there are more than uh, to uh, to 100, uh, 200 clinics and hospital uh, within this uh, this environment, and the highest density of academic and private research uh, in Europe. So the, the, this is a very good place to enter the uh, the European market. So uh, our vision today for uh, for NextMed is uh, is to develop an integrated approach to health by expanding the value chains that goes from prevention through care and surgery to continue with remote monitoring care as well as ELs. Uh, we are convinced that the precision ecosystem uh, will foster uh, acceleration and development, uh, and that the uh, vertical value chain uh, will foster uh, the, 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 product, um, the product launch uh, on the market. And that's important also to, to, to keep in mind that to, we, we have to, uh, to bring new solution and new uh, more effective model uh, with uh, specific and very rapid outcomes. <coughs> so uh, yeah, here you can see just next matters, uh, next matter at a glance, uh, focusing on fostering and complete uh, and thriving ecosystem. Uh, so if I more go, uh, if I go more in depth, just the um, the, the different axes of development. So the, the, the first one is the uh, research to pass to patient vertical value change. Uh, second one, the EU and international business development. Then the office spaces for doing synergistic collaboration. And this is, I mean, this is very important. Apply, uh, the employee wellness and greatness. This is next med. <laughs> and uh, we may, maybe just one word to, to, to explain what is the uh, the vertical value chain. Uh, in in fact, as already as uh, Alice already said, uh, we we have to uh, to think uh, about a new model, and we we need to merge uh, tech digital biology issue to. Uh, uh, to undertake new specific questions. Uh, and NextMed comprehensive team wants to help to create or integrate such value chain or precision ecosystem to solve your specific question and then accelerate your innovation or product development and precision ecosystem. And that's one, that's the key. Precision ecosystem include patients, scientists, startups, surgeons, and doctors. And so we, we can bridge, if you have any question, uh, and if we can answer, of course. Uh, so uh, we, we can work with you to, uh, to build uh, such an ecosystem. So that is the, the, the strength of NextMed, an innovation campus focused on patient journeys, a campus which consider as a world the field of digital health, prevention, home care, and medical and surgical innovation. Obviously, we will rely on, your, on, uh, on our strengths, with the, uh, which are uh, genetics, uh, chronic diseases, neurosciences, and oncology. That's not a bad thing. Uh, and uh, you'll see... Later, Jacques Maresco and uh, Prof uh, Professor Jacques Mar Maresco and Professor Luc Soleil, uh, who will illustrate such precision ecosystem regarding surgical innovation and diagnostic tools. 
So with NextMed, you will be able to uh, to rely on uh, to rely on a team, but also you will be able to uh, you will be able to uh, to rely on a hospital for uh, your proof of concept and first year with the customer. Uh, so you have the uh, Swasbourg General Hospital, but also uh, a cancer dedicated hospital to, uh, to to work with to partner for clinical trials and clinician feedback feedbacks. That we know that this is uh, an asset and this is uh, this often is the key. Uh, to uh, to success, uh, you can rely with Nextmed. You can rely on contact manufacturer to scale up uh, in medtech and biologics. Uh, this is this just uh, this are just some example uh, on who you can rely on. Uh, you can rely on investment program and partners uh, as Innovo Capital because uh, I know at least uh, that you're part of this uh, terrific and fantastic organization. Uh, you can rely on um, uh, inter international legal breaks acceleration uh, and access access. You can access to a technology transfer company, uh, which is called Connectus. You can access incubators, accelerators, and also uh, you can access some business development organization. Uh, and I want to mention BioBare France, uh, who we are partner with uh, for the, uh, the next net development. It's important to know when you when you enter a cross-border region, and I mean this is the linear way to access the EU market. Uh, working with Swasbourg uh, allows you to uh, directly access the three large European countries: France, Germany, Switzerland, within a single location. Uh, and also, you will benefit from tailored programs to understand France and Europe laws and institution uh, just out of France from the European Commission uh, did uh, did before. Uh, you can have access to the, the knowledge of a pool of um, 50,000 research through a three national academic consortium. And that also is the key for the IP questions. And what is quite cool is that from Strasbourg, uh, that's also uh, a link, a direct link with Boston, because uh, as you may know, Strasbourg and Boston are twin city. And that's also why we, uh, we, we, uh, we have such connection uh, with this, uh, this Boston ecosystem. We also have, due to um, Professor Maresco and Yakar, we have office and presence in Boston, Brazil, Tokyo, Taiwan. Uh, and we, uh, we have entrepreneurs from all over the world. And uh, obviously, we work with our three national environment to develop the tech transfer network with SAT Connectors and the Cartier organization. Uh, just a word about the uh, the next mid district new buildings because we uh, we we all know that's that's an important question. So we uh, we actually built uh, more than uh, fifty thousand square meter dedicated to innovation, and the the, the, the building the as the, the building you can see on the uh, on the screen. So this is a, a before after. Um, the uh, this building is is actually under construction and we be in operation uh, by the beginning of 2022 and uh, it, this building will be part of uh, a set of uh, six or seven uh, new buildings uh, to uh, to allow company from uh, from abroad um, to uh, to set up companies and to develop uh, within the uh, the European market what you can see on the uh, on the right part of the of the screen is one of our uh, nurseries for starter this is the former faculty of medicine which is called the pitch 8 uh, and uh, uh, i have to say that that could be also a solution for occupy who just want to uh, uh, to um, to to be present in Swasburg as a uh, as a plug and play uh, plug and play connection and to try our, env our environment uh, so that's a, i have to say that's a cool place so you, you, you will find some, uh, so this is classical scene, modern office and lab spaces. Um, 
you will find because don't forget that we are in France. You you you'll find business and entertainment companions, uh, restaurant, cafeteria. Uh, you'll find uh, everyday events to learn, to network, uh, and something uh, that is very special. Uh, it is the uh, the hospital cellar because in France the, that's a tradition to uh, to also have uh, a cellar uh, within uh, within an hospital campus. Strasbourg, next med, a place uh, where you can hire top talent, top school in biotech, medtech, engineering, data, and, and, and EHI, business and IP management. But uh, what is important is to be able to retain them, uh, to retain them with office spaces, inspiring creativity, design for humans, with gym, pool, childcare solution uh, that help company to, uh, to his hiring and retention in a city recognized for ex exceptional quality of life. I have to say that, yeah, uh, I really decided that we, uh, we were ranking first uh, in terms of uh, quality of life in, um, in France. Just as conclusion, just one picture with the, the fast track start with NextMed. Uh, it's important for us to, um, uh, to understand your business need and help you to execute this rapidly. Uh, and then to conduct a rapid evaluation of your market opportunity and build with you uh, a local and European network. Then uh, we connect you, we are able to connect you with some key stakeholders to help you accelerate European success and build locally your team and access resources. And then finally, we find and provide you office space where your employee research and commerce can stream. So perfectly designed to enable excellence. My last word, next med, that's a clear promise. And the business comes first because it saves life. Excellent. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you very much. So this is really exciting to see what next med is becoming. Uh, you've heard it. If you need a place where you need access to hospitals to uh, basically test your proof of concept, access to many resources, buildings, and incredible people, NextMed is the place to be. So really great to have had this presentation. Nicola, thank you very much. So we're running a few minutes late. Uh, apologies for this, probably five minutes behind schedule. So with no further ado, extremely excited to introduce to you, all of you, uh, Jack Maresco, founder of IRCAD, and also the individual who has uh, done the world's first telesurgery from New York. So this is extremely exciting uh, to hear this story today. Uh, Professor Maresco, thank you for being here. You're one of the, uh, uh, you're the, you know, probably the best innovator, one of the best innovators in Strasbourg. IRCAD is recognized globally as a hub of excellence for surgery, for innovation. You're working with the best companies from Medtronic, Siemens, Intuitive, you know, Carl Storrs, you name it. So it's, it's really an honor to have you today. So thanks for being there. And I will leave the floor to you. And I hope everyone is doing well in the attendees. Feel free to ask questions, network in the chats. This is also there for that. So thanks everyone for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, uh, Alistair, for your kind introduction. And thank you, uh, Alistair and Nicola Pellerin for organizing this uh, kind of session because I think it's uh, very motivating and it's very interesting. And also, I'm very happy to meet for the first time uh, Dara Paradiso, uh, our General Consul of the United States, who, who arrived just in August. It was not a good period, but I hope she will uh, visit IRCAD because we have so many uh, collaboration with uh, United States. So my, my topics will be short, uh, less than 15 minutes to explain uh, uh, what we do in IRCAD, the history of IRCAD, the relation we, we have. And we can start by the first, uh, the first slide, please. Uh, okay, so the, the, topic, uh, the topic today of uh, IRCAD, the institute we have created now 27 years ago in Strasbourg, is to try to invent the future in surgery. That means a mix between robotics, imaging, artificial uh, intelligence. I have to say that when we decided to create IRCA, that was after an exceptional lecture of this man, an American colonel of the US Army, a surgeon. It was in 1991 in Germany. And uh, 
these men as really the vision of the future. And uh, the, the name of the lecture was Medicine will switch from industrial age to information age. And uh, in 1991, you imagine he explained the power of internet, the power of robotics did not exist at this period, the power of uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, all these concepts were only concept. And when I came back from this lecture, we decide to create an institute totally dedicated to information age and surgery. And uh, we, important to say that we have a great environment such as uh, University Hospital, University of Strasbourg, which is uh, nearly in the top 100 uh, worldwide uh, ranking uh, in the ranking of Shanghai. And since the beginning, the topics were augmented surgery. And uh, what is augmented surgery? It is uh, augmented vision for the surgeon. That means the surgeon could see in transparency. Augmented uh, gestural as uh, a hand of the surgeon, that is robotics. And augmented the brain of the surgeon, and that is artificial intelligence. So augmented eye is uh, certainly one of the most important today uh, because all the surgeons, they want to understand more the medical image. So that is uh, 3D reconstruction, you, you know, uh, it is a medical image and very difficult to understand. You have software and with some software and algorithm, it's possible to have the 3D reconstruction of the patient. And it looks like a very realistic digital clone of the patient. We see all the details of the anatomy and it is very easy to understand and to have the, the best strategy for the operation. We can do that for a lot of things. And also after that, after the reconstruction, we can simulate the operation. Here, you know, there's these three little bowls in green, uh, metastasis of a cancer. With a computer, it's possible uh, to understand what is the part we reject the liver, what is the part we ablate the, 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 the tumor with uh, heat, that is radiofrequency or cryoablation. And you see that it is possible to take this virtual image and uh, to take virtual uh, uh, instruments and to, to know and to understand the best way to perform the operation. We take here, you know, the virtual optic that we introduce in the abdomen and on the left on the window, we understand and we see the 3D image with a possibility of fusion, that means of augmented reality. And that is the next step. Virtual image, real image given by the camera, fusion of both, that is a concept of transparency, that is a concept of augmented reality. We start a lot of years ago, we published in JAMA, and uh, you see that that is a big tumor in green uh, uh, of uh, what we call the adrenal gland. So the first step is always the same. It is a 3D reconstruction. So you see that we can move the image. We have the image of 3D. We understand all the different landmarks. We understand the vessels. And during the operation, when we dissect, you see in blue, it is a big vein, the vena cava going uh, in, in the heart. You see that we are asked to see in transparency and in transparency, we see the two vein, and when uh, uh, we dissect, you will see the, uh, the renal veins, the vein uh, coming from the kidney. You see in transparency in the fat, we see also the exact position of the artery. So that is augmented reality, and that is the future of surgery, especially if we imagine that one day surgery will be automatic as aeronautics, as a, a automatic car. The second challenge after the image, which is certainly one of the most important, is what we call augmented hand. Augmented hand, that is robotics. So uh, since uh, the beginning of the creation of IRCAD, we were totally fascinated by the concept of robotics. Uh, perhaps you remember that in uh, 2001, we published in Nature the Lindbergh operation that was the first uh, worldwide remote surgery, long distance remote surgery, because personally I was in New York and my patient was in Strasbourg. Uh, it was not a, a surgical challenge, 
because it was a very simple, what we call cholecystectomy, that is the ablation of the, of the gallbladder. But it was uh, really an information challenge. And uh, you see the setting, setting of the robot uh, uh, at this period, it was a Zeus robot uh, coming from United States, Santa Barbara. It was uh, uh, the company Computer Motion. So that is the setting in our operating room. And uh, you will see when everything is uh, just uh, in stale, after that, uh, uh, all the work was performed from New York and 80 engineers from France Telecom were uh, on the bridge. And uh, personally, I was in New York. It's very interesting because today, everybody speak about the development of remote surgery due to the 5G. But uh, that was more than 20 years ago. And it was without the 5G, it was just ATM lines. And uh, in New York, it was a subsidiary of uh, uh, France Telecom, Equant, and that was uh, the origin of uh, uh, the performance of this operation. Uh, that was published in Nature. You know that it is a very pre prestigious uh, paper. Uh, we work also a lot on uh, the integration of image in the robotic system. So here you see the robot, which is uh, the Da Vinci robot from Intuitive Surgical, also in uh, California. And uh, you see that the, the surgeon has like a GPS, <laughs> like a GPS uh, that you have in all the car. And when he is emerged in the master part of the robot, you see that he has a normal vision of uh, the, given by the camera and also the 3D vision given by the computer. And uh, you see that it is like a GPS because he can understand all the different landmarks. Finally, uh, we work also a lot on uh, the concept of augmented brain augmented brain, that is artificial intelligence. And uh, everybody speak about artificial intelligence since five years, but we work on that since uh, more than 10 years uh, with different topics. One was a Condor project, which is how we can imagine to have a, a control tower in the operating room. And uh, today it is possible because you see that uh, we can collect uh, all the data of the a preoperative image, medical image, uh, the external camera, the laparoscopic camera uh, during the operation, all the physiological signals given by the anesthesiologist, and uh, uh, all that we can concentrate, we can storage, and we follow all this data until the patient can return uh, at work. Another example of uh, artificial intelligence is uh, a, a big modification of the, of the workflow of the patient. You know that we uh, know that uh, the patient has to uh, quit the hospital very early. That is a consequence of what we call the ERAS project. Uh, ERAS is enhanced recovery after surgery. We know that if the patient quits the hospital, even after a, a very important operation, <clears throat> you decrease not only the nosocomial disease, but also you decrease by 50% the percentage of complication. And uh, we, <clears throat> we, we have discovered uh, a startup who was in California, and uh, uh, after two years of discussion, this startup decided to come in Strasbourg. It is a, a RDS company. They have performed the best uh, uh, patch that we can imagine. What is a patch? It is uh, something with uh, a lot of vital parameters. You see that we have uh, 11 key parameters that can go in the cloud, go in your iPhone, iPad, etc. And you see that we have uh, an electrocardiogram, we have the saturation of oxygen, we have the respiratory rate, we have the skin temperature, you have the body position, that means the detection of, uh, of foreign. Uh, that is really uh, uh, an exceptional patch, and we know how difficult it is to put all these sensors in a very little uh, system. And uh, that will be a total modification of uh, the hospitalization of, of, of a patient, because uh, that is the only way to be sure to convince the patient that even out of the hospital, he has a perfect control. And what we work today with artificial intelligence is to imagine, you know, that if you have a big problem, for example, heart rate, immediately you have an alarm. If you have an elevation of the temperature, you have an alarm. But what we would like to have is to, to know what is 
uh, the percentage, what is the patient who is going to have an alarm? That means to detect predictive factors by artificial intelligence to know two hours before the percentage of patient who is going to be rehospitalized. And that is a very nice uh, project. And you see that uh, you can be connected and in real time with just three seconds of latency, we have all these parameters. So uh, we were very proud that the company just joined the team uh, of IRCAD and IHU uh, in, uh, in Strasbourg. I just want to finish to say that uh, uh, with all these different uh, uh, modification of uh, surgery, we need also to, to have a training uh, concept. And uh, the training is how we can uh, train, you know, surgery is a companionship. So here we have the, uh, our uh, experimental uh, room with the last generation of uh, minimal invasive surgery. Uh, we work on simulators, on uh, pigs, on cadaver, and it is the best way for the surgeon to learn uh, the new technology. We do the same for robotic surgery. And that was after the visit of Gary Guttat, the CEO of, uh, of uh, Intuitive Surgical in California. Uh, it was a challenge. He asked us after his visit, uh, is it possible to have the most important place in Europe here? And in two months, we have uh, uh, totally destroyed 800 square meters. And now we have a platform with uh, 13 uh, robots uh, coming from Intuitive Surgical. So that really is uh, for us uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful partner uh, we, we work with. We develop also a flexible endoscopy training course because we know that flexible endoscopy, it's very important for, uh, for the education of, of the surgeon. And now we extend our institute because we have understood that the next uh, generation of uh, training will be more robotic training than uh, conventional minimal invasive surgery. So we have the robot of intuitive surgical, but we have also a partnership with Medtronic since long years, more than 20 years. We have a partnership with Cambridge Medical, and we have uh, totally renovated, not renovated, rebuilt uh, a building totally, totally dedicated to research and education in uh, 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 robotic surgery. I want to, to finalize with the globalization of the concept. You see that uh, we have uh, now an aircraft issue in France. Uh, it was in 1994, in Taiwan in 2008, uh, in Libano uh, in 2019, but before we had two in Brazil, Sao Paulo and uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro, two big projects, one in Africa, in Rwanda, one in China, and discussion today. Uh, with a big uh, company in United States uh, to build uh, an IRCAD in uh, US. So thank you very much for your time. And if you have any question, I'm totally able uh, to, to answer. Excellent. Thank you very much, Professor Marisco. This was a great presentation. Thank you. So, so I'm going to start maybe Professor Marisco with a question. So. You know, it was interesting to hear about the multi-sensor patch, you know, so what this triggers as a sort of thinking for me is, you know, we're seeing all these rapid tests where you can test, you know, for, you know, potassium, diabetes, and, and even COVID, and now we have all these sensors. So are we becoming more and more sort of a bionic human, right, connected to technologies? And, you know, what's the view, what's your perspective on this? You know, in the next 10 years, 20 years, you will, will we be always connected to some sort of device or what's your th thinking there? So the uh, good question, uh, you know, the patch which has been developed by the, the startup and now the company RDS, uh, as uh, several parameters you have seen today, no biological parameters, but to show it's uh, certainly something which is going to be also important and we can imagine to add. Uh, something you have to understand is that uh, uh, it's a big, big change in the philosophy of, of an hospital. Hospital will be the platform for the period you have to operate the patient. But uh, just after that, I mean, really, even after a, a, a very important operation, we know that it is possible to go out of the hospital after 24 or 48 hours. And I have explained during the lecture, that is the concept ERAS, which has been developed in Europe. It was more in the north of Europe. So we know that the patient has to leave. 
But you know also that uh, the concept of uh, hospitalization in uh, uh, Europe is not the same that in United States. In United States, it's very often common to go out of the hospital after three or four days. Why? Because it is very expensive and majority of patients, they have to pay. Uh, in France, for example, nobody pays. So uh, the patient is very well uh, to stay in the hospital even when really he doesn't need uh, any care from a nurse. And so with, uh, but uh, the patient say, uh, I don't want to go out of the hospital. But if you explain to the patient that if he can move out of the hospital because he will have less complication. So that is uh, something he understand. It's not to do some economy. It is just because it is better for the patient, he will accept. And for that, we need a patch. And uh, you know, it's very interesting because we discuss about that since more than six years with different company, also with giant. And always it was a failure because when we see the little patch you think it's easy to have all these parameters? No, 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 because it is more complex than just uh, uh, to have just a, 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 a watch. You know that if you have your watch here, for example, I can have my electrocardiogram, but I have to push. And uh, that is impossible if it is in a post-operative period. You need to have a 24 hours recording. And as I explained also, it's a fantastic tool for artificial intelligence to try to find the predictive parameters. What is a patient who in five minutes, in, in two hours is going to have a complication? And this patient immediately need to go back to the hospital. And we know in the ERAS program in Europe that 10% uh, of patients have to go back to the hospital. But 10 patients, 10% uh, of the patient, it's nothing because that means 90% of the patient can be out of the hospital. So it's a total change in the workflow of the patient. Excellent, excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you, Professor Masco. And indeed in the US, we have uh, this concept, you know, the home hospital where a lot more patients are gonna be, you know, be take, being taken care at, of at home. So a lot of technology devices helping do this. So this is really good and, and great to hear the passion you have when you, you talk about this. So we have a few questions here. I have a couple more. So we have Alexandre Blanchot, who is an economic developer uh, in Boston for the, Den for the Denmark uh, region. So how do you see a collaboration between US and Europe when we know that US hospitals have early access and broader access to new robotic tools for surgery compared to French hospital? What could be a win-win collaboration? Uh, in, in French, which, which was, they have a better access or less access to robotics and new technology. I have not understood. So when we know that US hospitals have early access and broader access to Europe, so better access. Apparently, the US hospitals in Europe access. No, apparently in the US. I in US. Uh, oh, okay, so th that's true. Why? Because the first robot, they have been initiated by United States, first of all, by the US Army. And after that, it was developed by Intuitive Surgical. And it was very expensive because today, for example, the robot of Intuitive, it's around $2.2 uh, million. Okay, but now... What happened? You have a lot of competition. You, you have sure the intuitive surgical robot, but you have the Medtronic robot that is in US. You have the transenteric robot also in US. In Europe, you have the robot of Cambridge, which is a good one. You have the robot of Medicaroin done by Germany and by Japan. So what we are going to face to a decrease of the cost and uh, an increase of the technology. So advance of intuitive surgical, they have, uh, they have 10 years of advance. But when you look at the new generation of robots, uh, they are not so bad. And some robots, you have also the robot of Johnson & Johnson, which is Verb, and Verb will be an exceptional uh, robot. So due to the fact, that, and also something you have to know, that uh, I think nearly 100% nearly of the operation except transplantation will be performed for robots. That is for all the different specialties. Uh, 20 years ago, at the beginning, when we start and when it was a conference of Satava, it was an exception. It was like a dream to imagine the robot. It has been so long to develop the robot. You, have, you, you had so many uh, conservative surgeons attacking the robot to say it is too expensive, no benefit for the patient, because it was the first generation of robot. The generation of robot, especially due to what Luc Solaire 
Professor Soler is going to show. That means the integration with the image. And that is the reason why Johnson & Johnson, they have invested in a visible patient and because they have a robot and they know very well that that will be a fantastic plus for the new generation of robots. So what uh, the comment that you had, uh, sure, it was a case in United States, but I think that in the next uh, five, 10 years, it will be a routine to use a robot for all the speciality. Excellent, well, thank you, thank you for this. So one more question here. So in terms of early detection of chronic diseases, you know, we've heard you know, several people today talk about the importance of early detection. So obviously you, you play in your field a huge role there in improving outcomes, you know, what are the trends you're seeing that could really drastically, you know, help with okay. early detection? So you, you have some research that we can do in our institute and they were initiated by Professor Soler, for example, artificial intelligence, how artificial intelligence can support the radiologist to have an early detection of an image for the CT scan, etc. But we know that there is a limit of artificial intelligence, which is able only to do one task. But you have another You have, for example, Medtronic, uh, Olympus in Japan, but Medtronic in the United States. They have a system whose name is Genius. And this system is uh, uh, how we can have an automatic detection, automatic detection of a very little polyp uh, in, the, in the colon. That means a polyp of less than five millimeters that very often the gastroenterologist uh, is unable to see. And that is uh, fantastic. Olympus is ready and uh, Medtronic is going to be ready in uh, six months of one year. You can have the diagnosis. That means you can do the difference between a polyp, which is dangerous because it can have a transformation in a cancer. We call that an adenoma. And a polyp whose name is an hyperplasia, absolutely no risk. You don't need to remove that. And what we see today is that because nobody knows if it is adenoma or hyperplasia, you uh, remove all the polyp in the world. It's uh, billions of, uh, of dollars because you need uh, to remove, you need to have an analysis, that means the histology, you have a percentage of complication because you remove. So you imagine the economy due to artificial intelligence. So these are just two examples, one from IRCAD, one from uh, our partners. Excellent. And that's what's, you know, exciting about NextMed, where this cluster will help with these types of innovation. So last questions from Tamin Daoudi. So did creative people such as designers, architects, artists play a role in the conception of innovative spaces such as IRCA? And do you think uh, that design is also a key part of medical innovation? Uh, sure. Sure, because, you know, first of all, we like the design. Uh, always, you know, uh, I say that for the same cost of uh, what I call a public uh, building, uh, like some in university, we can do some marvelous things. And uh, we, we have some discussion. I remember when we had also uh, what we call the annex of IRCAD, which is, is a renovation of the Arras of Louis XV. It is a building of uh, 1755. And the architect, uh, Patrick Join, is an internationally renowned. He has a lot of uh, building in Las Vegas, in New York. And he, we had such a good uh, feeling together because he wanted to be a surgeon. And I remember very well, he visited IRCAD. He was uh, trained uh, on the robot. And after that, we have a discussion. He, he has done an exceptional design for, for that. For, not for free, but for peanuts, for really nothing. And after that, we had uh, the award, I, I know, because the AHA had the awards of the best design restaurant in the world. Uh, it was in London, uh, 800 candidates. And all the renovation of what we do today for the, uh, for the uh, robotic uh, uh, new building, it's always a lot of uh, new design because we know that uh, you know you need to work in an exceptional environment, and that is the same for all the different aircraft. In Africa, you have to see it will be the best one and the huge one. It is a fantastic African design, 
And it's very interesting, sorry, because it is a meeting with United States, but the first, the first project was like a mall, an American mall. And I say to the president of uh, Rwanda, Paul Kagame, no, 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 you need to keep the design of Africa. And uh, our architect, which is a fantastic uh, designer, he has done something exceptional for, for the environment of Africa. So my answer is absolutely as important as science, and also because I understand more the designs than the science. The science is Professor Soler. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you, Professor Maresco. This uh, is a great uh, way to close this uh, talk. Thank you so much for being with us. And we'll it was a pleasure. You. It was a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Welcome, Luc. So Luc Soler is the president of Visible Patient. He participated in the Boston Strasbourg Initiative in 2019. I'm very glad to have you and see you again uh, digitally. It would be great to see us physically, but uh, you know, this is the best we can do. So really happy to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for your invitation. You know, it's normal to have me in a virtual world because I work every day in the virtual world. And so <laughs> work at distance is logic. So I immediately share my screen. Uh, you see that the project that I have today is to present you a, an example of what can be uh, an efficient Strasbourg ecosystem link with USA partnership. And if they ask me to present something, it's because we have lots of already plan and realize uh, result of this kind of uh, partnership. For, for instance, to start really fastly, we have worked and we work currently a lot with a Biomodex company. It's a company located in Boston and in Paris. And this startup propose a model, like you see here, printing model from 3D models that we provide them. It is a system. What you perhaps don't know is the fact that this startup start all history in ARCAD by developing this own surgery for the own course, the course in the RISP uh, for ARCAD. And it was the beginning of their story. And thanks to ARCAD, they have proved the capability to do simulator based onto printed model. And from this start, they developed their story in Boston and uh, as you know, also in Paris. Second example of such partnership is really recent. It's our partnership with Eticon, Johnson & Johnson. Uh, we have signed an exclusive marketing and sale partnership. They presented this partnership soon, uh, not soon, <laughs> in a, in last week or two weeks ago on to the 19th November. Uh, and it's a really big story for the future. And now I would like to explain you why it was possible. It was possible because we have an amazing ecosystem in Strasbourg. And this ecosystem is based initially from IACAD, which is an amazing institute of research that Professor Marisco presented you. But it's not only IACAD, the ecosystem of Strasbourg. IACAD is a base, but you have also another base, which is the University of Strasbourg, and the third part, which is the Strasbourg Hospital. And these three elements are really important. You have here public education, a public hospital, and here you have both, you have private education, private uh, assistance of patient and research. And also you, had, you need to add something for companies. And you have seen this wonderful presentation before with all the capability of company development in Strasbourg. So we have amazing place for that. And we have also amazing peoples because you can do nothing without peoples. And we have a really nice network not only in Strasbourg, you see also in Boston, and here you see a picture of my last year uh, position in, in Innovo when I was invited to, to be here and to learn. And I've learned lots of things in Boston. And one of the things I've learned is uh, American spirit that was amazingly useful for me when we have negotiated with Johnson & Johnson. I can say that it was one part of our success. And the last element that is really crucial is to have stars. And we have at Strasbourg an amazing star, a superman who is Professor Maresco, of course. <laughs> and this superman is, of course, unique. And you need to have such unique people who have vision of the future. So, of course, as you know, perhaps not, you don't know, but it's that surgeon would like to be superman. Professor Maresco is a superman. He's a surgeon. He's perfect. But he has some limitation. Like any surgeon, he cannot see through the patient. And it is a dream of every surgeon to see through. And to see through the patient, they need today to use medical imaging. So they haven't got an X-ray vision. They have a CT scan vision, a set of slides, cutting slides uh, with gray level image. And it is a major problem because in reality, you cannot really efficiently analyze gray levels. Here's a really exam easy example. Your brain analyzes this square here of the chessboard as a clearer uh, B uh, square than the A square. 
It's logic because you have an alternance between dark and white uh, uh, shells. And of course, in such a case, you understand that the B will be on the white and your brain immediately understands that it will be white. So of course, R is darker, but it's wrong due to the shadow with this cylinder. And when you put that outside from the chessboard, you can see, perhaps not well because you are distance, that the letter B square is darker than the letter A. It's not easy for your brain and for your eyes to see that, but for the computer, it's so easy because you have the value. And this value is the digital information. And it is what is interesting. With computer science, you have digital information much more accurate. If I link these two elements, you have a vision of variation of gray level from darker to whiter. It's totally wrong. There is no variation here. It's only due to the chessboard. It's an illusion that is due to the fact that we have a limited capability of view. We can see only 16 gray level of contrast. So it's the first limit we cannot see easily gray levels, and gray levels is the base of any medical imaging. Second problem, the medical image, as I've shown you, is cut in slice. And when you have cut in slice image, like for instance, this uh, Michael Murphy heart, certainly you know well this Michael Murphy heart, it's a set of objects like this, here it's a set of slices. We cannot understand what is this object from the slices. The only way to see that efficiently is to have the good orientation. It's kind, a kind of 3D reconstruction. And when you have this good orientation, you can understand what is this art. And it is exactly the problem of slices. When you combine these two limits of our brain, you obtain an amazing number of errors that create every year 40,000 deaths in US. It's an amazing number that can be overcome through technology. So what can we do? Of course, everybody cannot be a Superman. But I have a good news for you. In US, you have a superhero and lots of superheroes, and you have Iron Man. And you know, Iron Man is uh, based on two, an optimization of humans thanks to robotic and artificial intelligence. But if you notice efficiently what is inside the system of artificial intelligence, it's not only analysis, it's also a way to reproduce the information. Artificial intelligence will only detect the problem. But the visualization is the second element that allows you to understand the problem. For instance, if I say you that there is an error 502, you don't know what is this error, and you don't necessarily know where it is. The artificial intelligence has detected the error, but it doesn't assist you. To assist you, you need more. You need a visualization. And the human brain easily understands colors on 3D. So you can reproduce in 3D. You see the same here. And when you do that, you optimize the system. So artificial intelligence is only one element, but you need also visualization. And this visualization must be onto mobile system. It's what you see here. If you apply that to surgery, you obtain Medical Lab project. Medical Lab project was written on 1999 in IRCAD. It was the one of the first IRCAD projects. It was the first project I wrote uh, with Professor Moresco. We obtained a first fund in, uh, in Strasbourg, uh, thanks to the, the local region Alsace. And we have started this project. You see the project, the hospital send the medical image through internet. We do through our lab, medical lab, the 3D modeling. So we do the medical image analysis, thanks to artificial intelligence on, on computer software. And then we give back the model to the physician. It is what was planned, and it is what we realized after 15 years of research. And so after this 15 years of research, we have created Visible Patient Company, which is indeed the first uh, medical image analysis lab online. And you see how it works. The physician sends the image. It's a secure platform, so it will be uh, tended after that to visible patients that do the modeling. Really important, it is based on computer science. So behind the analysis by the computer science, we have human that control the result, that can correct the result, adjust the algorithm if mandatory, and there is a double check. Like in any airplane, you have double pilot to avoid any error. After that, we give back the result, and the surgeon can visualize the result. We can do that for any part of the human body, but we are focused essentially today on two these main organs, liver, uh, HPV to be more generic, thoracic surgery, urology, and colorectal. And we have some other applications, as you can see here today, that, is, that are today our main application uh, of our solution. Now, 
from this model, you can use it through an easy software, the visualization. And this software is free of charge. You can download it onto Apple Store. It's the name is Visual Patient or onto PC or Mac. And then you can visualize the results. So what does that give? I would like to give you an example, really easy example from a lungs. You see, I say easy example, but you understand immediately that it will be complex. Because when you see the branches, you understand that surgery of lung is complex. We speak about early detection of pathologies. It's one solution to detect earlier. But sometimes, even if you detect earlier, you cannot apply necessary surgery. And there is a second problem. What arrives when you cannot detect earlier? Is there no solution for surgery? Is there only drug? The answer is yes, there is some other solution with surgery if you have a better vision. I would like to give you this example. It's a patient who had already a resection of half of her leg, of left lungs due to a first cancer. Then she had a second cancer. And then they have resected a second lung on the right part. And you see the problem now. She had a third cancer here. And they don't know what to do because they cannot reject another lung. How to solve the problem? With visible patient, first you have a 3D reconstruction. So an image analysis, you see it's like Google map. You have the map, which is a satellite view and that is superimposed. Uh, so you have the map in color that is superimposed onto the satellite view that is a medical image. And from this map, it's this kind of thing exactly is what I mentioned before. It's the error 502. It's a really interesting information, but it doesn't give you a, an enough easy to understand image we can so switch in 3D to have the same patient in 3D. What's that change? In this case, everything. Because thanks to this 3D image, we can see here, and I will show you that we have the list of organs, we can remove arteries and veins and check the location of tumors. We can see here that the tumor is located in this territory that is known for surgeon as the segment nine. Here, there is an anatomical variation. There is two branches for this segment nine. So what we can propose is to reject only these small branches. First, great benefit. If you be, want to be more large, you will reject these two parts. But what is important here is to reject these tumors. And what is also really important is to be sure that you will reject the good arteries and vein. Normally, for one branch, you have one branch of artery and one branch of vein. So if you don't have the 3D modeling, you will cut the first artery and vein you will find around this branch. So for the artery, you can superimpose, and you immediately see here the artery corresponding to this branch. No problem, it's normal, like what you could expect. What about the vein? It's totally different story, because for the vein, you see that you have this vein here with a drainage that is an accessory drainage coming from this branch just here. If you cut this branch, which should be logically what you do if you don't have this map, you will kill this, tumor, this segment just near the normal natural segment. That means that if you don't have the model, you will make a mistake. Without this model, you cannot do any surgery like that, what we call segmentectomy. It's not me that says that, it is the surgeon who did the surgery. Here is this feeling after the surgery. This intervention could not have been considered without that kind of 3D reconstruction and no other therapeutic project was contemplated for this patient. It is exactly what we expect from virtual reality associated to artificial intelligence. Be able to create a possibility of surgery, that means of creative surgery, to a patient that normally in the past should not have any surgery and should go to pharmac pharmacologic treatment that are of course important for patients where we cannot do surgery. But if we can do surgery, it should be better of course to propose a curative solution. So it's an example to uh, illustrate you what we do. We have performed more than 4,000 patients. It's a number before this year. So we have performed 1,000 more patients this year. And we have another aspect that is important. We have obtained uh, coverage by private French insurance. And we have large number. Uh, I can announce that we have signed recently with Alliance on ProBTP uh, Grand Test. Uh, it was last week. So we have more and more insurance working with us. And it's a really important information. For instance, in Strasbourg, uh, at the hospital of Strasbourg, the team who work with visible patients, and to the 31 patient performed to the last two months, 17 was covered by their insurance. So you see, it's a really important percentage. Now, uh, this image can be used preoperatively, but also intraoperatively of course, from a tablet, but I say you that we will become an Iron Man and an, an Iron surgeon. So we have also work with, of course, the HoloLens, and it's what you see here. 
with the HoloLens, it is what I see with my eyes. I see through, so I can see my normal environment, and I can manipulate with my hand the object like if it is in the air. It is exactly the image of Iron Man that I've shown you before, and it is what we can expect from the future. This future is named digital surgery uh, in the Johnson & Johnson proposal. It will be linked, of course, to robotic surgery, as Professor Morisco said you. So what we can conclude on that, success is not final, failure, failure is not fatal, it is the courage to continue that comes. Why I conclude with that? I've shown you success, why I say you, success is not final. And why I say you, failure is not fatal? It's because this year we have discovered a new pathology that changed everything. It was COVID-19. And perhaps you don't know, but COVID-19 reduced the number of, of surgery. It was a cancellation number of 72% worldwide. It's an amazing number. That means that every day, every day, we have 2 million of people who have a cancellation of their surgery during the lockdown that we, have, we had in our countries. How we can solve the problem? Because this problem is important. Every patient who has a cancer who could not have a surgery can be delayed, but perhaps what you don't know with this article is the fact that they said to cover the number of delayed surgery, we should need an increase of 20% of the surgical activity during 45 weeks. It's impossible. So of course, after 45 weeks, several patients will become not uh, operable. They cannot have a surgery. So what we did in front of this problem is the fact that we have said success is not final, but also failure is not fatal. So we have said, what is the problem? The problem is to detect earlier the COVID-19 problem. And here is how they were working. They were working from an image, and of course, it's not easy to do that. So we have used our visible patient software to do an analysis of the image. What you see here is a safe lung without any pathology. And what we did with our system is to detect in the same way a pathological lung attacked by COVID. And here is what you can see with a direct volume rendering. It's nice because you immediately see the pathology, but it's not an informative enough information. What you need is to have the volume of the infection. And it is exactly what we did to create what we have called the new uh, diagnosis of severity. And it is what you see here, the software we have developed allow to detect fully automatically the different area where it is attacked or not, where you have a, an infection or not, and so you can compute the percentage of remaining safe lung with this system. It's under uh, evaluation currently. We have not yet the CE mark or FDA approved for this new diagnosis of severity. But the first result of that was to show from the first study, uh, and it's, a pre of course, a preliminary study result. It is that when the, third, the patient arrives in the emergency department, we can no seven days before what will be his level of infection seven days later, it's only from the image. That means that we can know the severity level when he arrives immediately, even if all patients look similar. So with this image, you understand that my, my wording, which is the fact that optimist is believing that every problem is an opportunity to make a world better place. And it is exactly what I've shown you with COVID-19. It was a real, real big problem for all the humanity, but it was also an opportunity to do something better. And this optimist is exactly what you find in Strasbourg. Here, it's a website that has become an optimist with Strasbourg. It's not a story I invent. It was really, a, it is a real website with Strasbourg optimist. And I want to say to you that become an optimist for Strasbourg means do a better world for the future. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you, Luke. Thank you very much for, for this presentation. I am personally pumped uh, and very uh, energized by this, uh, by everything you're doing. It's clearly, you know, right on par with the issues at stake that we were talking about and the opportunities and, you know, congrats to visible patient and all the, the progress you guys have been making in the last few years there. Bravo. Any questions for Luke? We're a bit over time here. So let's uh, open for a couple of questions. Anyone has a question? Let's just see here in the question. Thank you, Luke. This was really great. Um, I'm just looking here, Luke, one second. So Nicolas Pellerin is asking, do Luke Solaire use only CT scans? 
No, I, we, we can use uh, also MRI, uh, but we need 3D imaging. So that means that without 3D imaging, you cannot do 3D reconstruction, of course. So we use CT or MRI. Okay. Any final questions from anybody? Okay, so I think, Luke, we can complete this. This was really great. Thank you, everybody, for participating. Janos, Ander, Dara, Nick Paradisio, Nicola Pellerin, really appreciated this uh, call today. And thank you for sticking to the end. Hopefully, we've all learned uh, a little bit what are the different you know, opportunities, challenges, and together we can actually help these entrepreneurs go a step further and continue to use the Boston Strasbourg ecosystem. I know Sarah Delude is with us from the Economic Development of Boston. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for being there as well. We had the Children's Hospital from Boston. We had several startups that are wanting to get in touch with IRCA. The new look will make the introduction as well. And uh, thank you to uh, Janosa Ander for covering you know, the European landscape. This is really great, guys, to see everything that's going on and we can change things and it's super exciting. Thank you, Nicola, for inviting us. Uh, NextMed is definitely the place to be and we're super pumped and excited. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank, Thank you for night. participating, everyone. If you need to contact anybody, just contact us or shoot, a, yeah, shoot me an email. That's the best. Everyone has my email, and I will make the introductions. Thank you, Thank Alisa. you everybody. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Alistair. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Great presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye.